Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So dear fellow believers, I'd like you to, for a moment, imagine a nation without laws. What would it be like? Maybe you, you picture a nation without laws or a place without laws as it's just some kind of utopia where it's just total freedom, where everyone is happy and everyone is healthy. Everyone can, can do as they please and, you know, you can sit around the campfire and you can sing kumbaya all you want because that's what life's like when there aren't any rules. Or maybe you think of life without laws and what comes to your mind is total anarchy total chaos where everyone just does whatever they want, whenever they want to do it, regardless of who it hurts and regardless of how it hurts them. Now I'm going to guess that unless we have a surprising number of anarchists here among us today, that most of you probably think more in line with that chaos and disorder if there weren't any laws, right? I mean, after all, What's going to make people live right? What's going to make people obey? What's going to make sure that, that people don't infringe on everyone else's rights if there aren't any rules and laws to follow? Usually we associate that, a lack of laws and a lack of rules with a lack of order, with people doing just whatever they want. But what if I told you that uh, Christianity actually presents, presents a scenario uh, where your relationship to God isn't contingent on your obedience and adherence to laws, but at the same time that it doesn't lead to anarchy and chaos. Do you think that's possible? Well, today's section of Galatians actually shows that Christianity, on one hand, it's not about laws and it's not about rules, but at the same time, it's not about doing whatever you want either. Well, how can that be? Let's find our answer in Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, where it says, when Cephas, that's Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, and yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. So how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is God's word. So the opening part of this text uh, talked about a, a public rebuke that happened between Paul and Peter. And here's what seems to have happened. We have to kind of piece in the details from what we read here and what we read in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul had been to Jerusalem before going on any of his missionary journeys. He had been there, he visited with Peter, and he visited with James, and he did that to confirm, to confirm that the message that he was proclaiming matched the message that the rest of the apostles were proclaiming. And it did. Then after his first missionary journey, Paul again went back to Jerusalem to do the same thing, to confirm that the message that he had gone and preached in all these towns on his missionary trip, that that message matched what the other apostles were proclaiming. And again, that was the case. The messages fit together perfectly. There was total agreement. And so sometime after that second trip that Paul made to Jerusalem, then Peter made a trip to the town of Antioch, uh, further up the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. And he went to Antioch to meet the Christians there and to have an opportunity to preach to them and to teach to them. 
Now that, that congregation in Antioch, they were a little bit different than what Peter usually dealt with in Jerusalem. That congregation in Antioch was largely of non-Jewish descent, which meant that they wouldn't have a problem eating things that Jews normally would not eat, like pork. They wouldn't have a problem associating with people that Jews normally would not associate with. And they didn't follow any of the rules and traditions that had been handed down by the Jewish people. And that was okay. See, the purpose of all those laws and ceremonies that the Jews followed, their purpose was to point ahead. It was to foreshadow Jesus and his saving work. And so now that Jesus had come, now that Jesus had lived, now that he had died and now that he had risen again, all those laws and ceremonies, they had really become obsolete. And so there was no purpose in making these Gentiles, making these non-Jewish people follow them. And so Peter... Though he was a Jew by birth, when he was among these people who weren't Jews, he had no problem associating with them. He had no problem joining them at their dinner table. He had no problem eating the food that they served, whatever that food was. He had no problem with any of it until, as our text says, certain men came from James. And that when they arrived, that's when Peter began to draw back and to separate himself from the Gentiles. And why did he do it? It says he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Uh, so these men from James, they come. Uh, Paul calls them the circumcision group. Now, without getting, to too many, getting into too many of the gory details about why he calls them that, you know, circumcision was the way in which Jewish men were physically marked as Jews, and it was also the way in which they were physically marked as those who adhered to the Jewish laws and the Jewish customs. And so then Paul calls them the circumcision group because it seems that this group of people were really big on that that they pushed for other people to have to get it done as well, even if they weren't raised Jews like they were. And so it says that these men came and that they came from James. Uh, James was the, the head of the Christian church in Jerusalem. Uh, while Paul had met with him prior in his two visits to Jerusalem, so it would seem a little surprising that these men would come from James. It's probably better that they were associates of James who had been sent to Antioch. You know, how are things going for Peter up there? And perhaps they were an example of overzealous and overenthusiastic lieutenants who came and actually ended up misrepresenting the will of the general. So it's likely that they were just associates of James who had been sent to Antioch. They took their assignment too far. They show up there. They see Peter eating with all these people who aren't Jews, and they take him aside and immediately say to him, perhaps something like this, Peter, what are you doing? Why are you eating with those Gentiles? No Jew who wants to be respected by his own people. No Jew who wants that is going to be eating with Gentiles. And so Peter, after that, began to withdraw. Instead of sitting with the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and having dinner with them, he began to sit at the tables filled with, with only Jews. And not only that, there were other Jews among that congregation who followed his lead. And so this sent a powerful message to those Christians in Antioch, particularly to the ones who weren't of Jewish descent. And the message was this, that you guys, you non-Jews, you guys are all second-class citizens because you don't follow the Jewish laws and traditions that we do. Ultimately, what did it wind up? It wound up that Peter ended up compromising the gospel. Compromising the gospel rather than upsetting some people who were loud, opinionated, but most of all, wrong. And so by giving into this pressure, Peter gave the impression to this non-Jewish audience that Jesus' perfect life and that his death and his resurrection, that all of that wasn't enough to make them beautiful to God, but that they had to do something else to become beautiful to God. And so Paul rebukes Peter publicly, telling him that he was not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is quite simple. It's that Every single human being is a weak and a guilty sinner. But on top of that, that Jesus lived perfectly, kept God's law in our place, died in our place, and rose again. And that by faith in him, God declares you to be perfect and righteous. So then the truth of the gospel is that our relationship to God depends on his grace and his goodness toward us and not on our works toward him or on our works toward others. And because of that, what Paul calls here works of the law you know, obedience to religious ceremonies, obedience to religious customs and things like that, none of those matter one lick when it comes to one's relationship to God. And so to fail to act in line with the truth of the gospel then is to live and to act toward others 
as if those laws, customs, and traditions do matter in terms of their relationship to God. It's not in line with the gospel because, to put it simply, if God doesn't deal with us on the basis of our works, if God doesn't deal with us on the basis of our conduct, then how dare we deal with others on the basis of theirs? See, the gospel of Jesus is all about the strong taking the place of the weak, the innocent taking the place of the guilty, the rich taking the place of the poor, because that's all what Jesus did to save us. And so then when we live in line with that, we put those same principles to practice in practice in our daily living. But Peter had become guilty of what we call legalism. Legalism, sometimes it's a tough word to define, but we'll do it here this morning. Basically what legalism is, It's to make rules where God does not and then to demand that other people follow those rules. Uh, To put it another way, it's to let commands, rules, and threats predominate rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. To put it yet another way, it's to focus on outward behavior rather than the heart. See, Peter fell into legalism by letting something be added to Christ's work. The problem with what Peter did wasn't that they added the Jewish laws and traditions. So the problem wasn't what they added. The problem with what happened with Peter was that they allowed anything at all to be added to the gospel. And so legalism, uh, this adding something to the gospel of Christ, it's something that we always, always need to be on guard against because it comes so naturally to every one of our hearts. As an example of how naturally it comes to us, I'd like to present you with a scenario. Uh, There's two men who come into church. One of them, as you can see, he's dressed in a suit, and in a tie. The other one's in a t-shirt and jeans. The guy who comes in a suit and tie, he wears a suit and tie because he was raised that that's how you dress for church. It's the right thing to do. You give God your best. The guy who comes in a, G- in a t-shirt and jeans says, you know, I don't really like to wear a suit and tie, so I'm not going to wear one because to do so would be inauthentic and fake. So now the question is, which of these two men is more pious and more godly? Is it the guy who wears the suit and tie because, you know, that's what you're supposed to wear to church? Is it the guy who wears the t-shirt and jeans because he's being real about who he is and he's not putting on a show for anyone else? Which one is more pious and godly? Do you agree with one of those two sides? If you do, that's legalism. Gotcha, right? (laughs) That's your question. Legalism is emphasizing behavior more than God's grace in Christ. So based on what I told you about these two men, they both came to church. The only difference is their dress. So based on what I told you about them, it's impossible for us to know which one of them is more pious or more godly than the other. And to presume to know that simply on the basis of their clothing, that's to elevate one style of clothing, one style of dress above another, and to say that this style is more holy and more godly than anything else when God has given us no specific direction on the matter. And that's why Paul rebuked Peter. Because of his sin of legalism, the focus was taken off of Christ, off of Jesus and his saving work, and it was placed on their obedience to those traditions. And because of that, Paul said, Peter stood condemned. We do the same thing when we take the focus off of Christ and put it on outward forms, outward behavior, outward actions, outward anything, we do the same thing. And we stand condemned just like Peter did. So friends, thanks be to God that, as I said a few moments ago, that our God does not deal with us on the basis of our conduct. That he does not deal with us on the basis of how well uh, we avoid legalism and how good we are at staying away from that. No, God deals with us on the basis of Jesus Christ. So Christianity then is not about adherence to rules or adherence to traditions, but it's about adherence to Christ. Verse 16 of our text says, a person is justified, not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So by faith in Jesus Christ, Paul says, you are justified. To be justified means to be declared innocent, to be acquitted. And so God declares you innocent of any and all sin, not on the basis of your behavior, but on the basis of Jesus. His perfect record has been given to you, and your imperfect and guilty record was given to him when he died on the cross. And so now when God sees you today, he doesn't see you as a legalist. God looks on you today and he sees only his perfect, his holy child. And that's what you'll always be by faith in him. Now if you're paying attention, maybe a question pops into your mind. All right, pastor, so 
if our relationship to God has nothing to do with our behavior, nothing to do with rules, things like that, then, then what reason do people have to live right and not to just go out and do whatever they want whenever they want? Well, Paul anticipated that question or that objection, and that led him to say this. Uh, but if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? You know, is Jesus promoting sin by saving us apart from our conduct? That's the question. Paul answers it plainly, not at all, no way. And how can he say that? He goes on, through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. You see, Paul, prior to becoming a Christian, he was not an irreligious person. He was a Jew of Jews, as he said. He earnestly sought to keep all of the laws and all the traditions that had been handed down to him from Moses and by the Jewish fathers. And in all of this, what, what was he doing? He was seeking to achieve, he was seeking to earn his right standing before God. So then all those good things that Paul did, all the laws that he kept, all the regulations that he followed, who was he really doing it for? Was he doing it for God? Or was he doing it for himself? Prior to becoming a Christian, he had been doing it all of it for him. He had been doing all of it for himself. Because what was his motivation? It was the reward that was in store for him, or at least the reward that he believed was in store for him for keeping all those commands. But when Paul became a Christian, you see, he died to the law and now he lives for God. See, now that the reward is already earned in Jesus Christ, he's free to do God's will for God's sake rather than for his own sake. I mean, that's what it means to live for God after all, is to do what God wants, not because I'm going to get something from it, but to do what God wants because it's simply what God wants to do. So if we think that people will give in to their every temptation if they're not under a divine threat, um, I don't know how we got ahead there. If they're not under a divine threat, then we don't understand the gospel um, because the gospel changes our attitude about behavior, changes our attitude about our relationship to God. When we understand the gospel, no longer do we do good just for ourselves, but we do it for him. Paul states this even more strongly in the very next verse. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, by faith in Jesus, uh, God treats you and me, he treats every single one of us as though all of our sin died with Christ on the cross. And he treats us as though all of us have lived the perfect life that Jesus lived. If you have children, I'd like you to think for a moment about the feeling that comes to your heart when you see your children doing well at something. You see them, you know, excelling at a sport, getting good grades in school, or showing compassion and kindness to someone else. What do you feel like when you see your child do that? Your heart kind of wells up with joy, doesn't it? Oh, they're learning something. They're taking something that I get from them. Now, with that in mind, I'd like you to consider how God the Father must feel when he looks upon the perfect life of Jesus. A life that's marked from start to finish with love, with compassion, with care, with self-sacrifice, with all of the good things that God seeks in all the world. He sees it all in Jesus and his heart must just overflow with joy at that perfect life of Jesus and he must just beam with happiness when he sees him. Well, now because Christ lives in you by faith, God looks on you the same way that he looks upon Jesus. Uh, with that same smile, the same glow. Because Christ lives in you, God doesn't see your sin, but he sees that perfect life that Jesus lived. And so now, because Christ lives in you, you can live your whole life knowing that the most glorious person in the whole universe found it worthwhile to lay down his life for you. That he would rather lose the universe than lose you. And so there you have much more powerful motivation to please God than fear, much more powerful motivation to serve God than any reward because you actually have Jesus in you. You're no longer trying to be good. You're no longer putting on a show of good behavior, but you're remembering who you are and you're showing the world who you really are in Christ. And so then Christianity, it's not about laws, nor is it about doing whatever you want. So then what is it? Is it a compromise between the two? There's an old Russian proverb that I think uh, helps us to understand this. It's about a hunter and a bear. Uh, the hunter pulls out his weapon. In this case, it's, it's, a, it's a bow and arrow. He takes careful aim at the large bear that he sees off in the distance. He's about to release, you know, to let that arrow fly when suddenly the bear speaks. And the bear says in a soft, soothing voice, Isn't it better to talk than to shoot? 
What is it that you want? Let's negotiate. So the, the hunter puts down his weapon uh, and actually sits down by the bear and they begin to talk. The hunter says to the bear, you know, all I really want is a fur coat. And the bear says to the hunter, that's good. All I really want is a full stomach. I think we can figure something out. So they sat down to talk and a little while later, the bear walked away all alone and you can guess that the hunter was nowhere to be seen. But the negotiation had been successful, right? The bear got what he wanted, and the hunter got his fur coat as well. They compromised, right? Compromise isn't always a good thing, and it's never a good thing when it comes to the gospel. So the truth is that Christianity is not about laws, nor is it about license to do whatever you want, and it's not a compromise between the two either. It's something different entirely. Christianity is about Jesus Christ. That God deals with us on the basis of Jesus' works, not our works. And then that same Jesus, he lives in us, he motivates us, he strengthens us and empowers us to live as the righteous people that God has declared us to be. So Christianity is about Christ, and let's keep it that way. Amen.